Neil was what you might call a checklist soft left member of the Labour Party. He seemed to go with all the easy popular policies. He is such a delightful man that he was liked by thousands and thousands of activists in the Labour Party, and he liked being liked. There's no doubt about it. Hey, Jim, all right. He really liked being liked. What happened to Neil was that he realised that being Prime Minister was more important than being liked. Everybody liked Neil Kinnock until he became leader of the Labour Party. And suddenly um, people turned against him and he found it very difficult to adjust to being unpopular. I remember Dennis Healy saying to me that uh, he and I had had 20 years of having a, an unpleasant fluid poured all over us. Dennis was slightly more graphic than that. Um, and we really got used to being immersed in this unpleasant substance. Um, Neil hadn't had it before and it takes some getting used to. Many felt Roy Hattersley was better suited to be leader. Hattersley was an accomplished journalist and writer, at ease with the influential London liberal establishment. It was a world which never warmed to Neil Kinnock. That uh, is my final word of thanks to all of you for coming. Michael, I'm deeply grateful that you should be here. To have the honour of having the second best journalist in the Parliamentary Labour Party with us this evening uh, is, a, is an immense privilege, and I am, as well as that, seriously grateful that you should come here. And I think certainly in the early days, on both sides, uh, there were quite a number of strains. I heard Neil refer disparagingly to Roy, and I also once overheard a comment in which uh, someone said to him, uh, you did terribly well, uh, why not to let Neil get on looking after the party? Yes. Well, that's useful. No, this uh, Labour values your values. That's and you represent uh, the party to the country, as it were. I mean, that was the, the, the sentiment expressed. But in my view, there was always um, a separate long-term agenda to which Roy and others were working. They were very keen to ensure the succession to one of them, as it were. And uh, I think they always felt that Neil was, a, was a, a necessity that had to be put up with rather than a, a wholehearted colleague. Well, I suppose that my abilities and one of the main reasons that I became elected leader of the Labour Party lie in the field of being a mobiliser, uh, uh, an advocate, an articulator, um, an enthuser. Um, Roy's attributes are perhaps more cerebral. Uh, and I could, I guess, defend the difference uh, on the basis that in order for a body to have life, it needs a heart and a stomach and a backbone as well as a brain. I think he was lacking in confidence. Uh, he, he was, um, in public, he was he was uh, a hail fellow, well met, full of bonhomie and so on. University of Wales, three Vascon But as a private person, I think he was assailed by all sorts of self doubt. But he was, I think, very quickly got at by the attacks mounted on him by the right wing press. They quickly found out how to get under his skin. And it was on this intellectual lightweight business. Well, I guess uh, I've been told so many times by so many people in so many articles in so many newspapers that I was stupid uh, that uh, maybe I believed a little bit of it. Shortly after Kinnock became leader, Tony Benn was returned to Westminster at the Chesterfield by-election. The campaign brought the two men face to face in a show of unity. I personally had no hopes for Neil Kinnock at all because I had, I had an opportunity of see, seeing him at work in the previous years and uh, he was selected really for the purpose of carrying on the destruction of the left, I think. And of course it wasn't very long before he changed his position on 
the miners, for example, which he'd strongly supported before on Europe, which, uh, where he'd been opposed to our entry into the community on um, nuclear weapons and so on. Listen. You're going to listen to me or the enemy? Yes. No, no. Okay. Neil Kinnock had publicly opposed Tony Benn's campaign for the deputy leadership. Now, as leader, he was determined to eradicate Benn's remaining influence within the party. Despite the friendly smiles in public, this is cozy, isn't it? the two men were to remain bitter enemies. Neil uh, did decide uh, to lead the party away uh, from the, the, the kind of uh, Benite left position, uh, which he, of course, had uh, shared uh, for many years in the late 1970s, uh, and to lead it uh, to, towards a more centralist position. Uh, that inevitably meant that Tony Benn either had to go along with it or he had to stand out. I mean, to Tony Benn's credit, he stood by what he believed the principled position to be. When you elected me to Chesterfield last year, they didn't elect me there to sit and watch Mrs Thatcher destroy the lives of working people in Chesterfield. They sent me there to fight for them. And it's here we go, here we go. The the working class. To Ben and the left, Kinnock's first act of treachery was not to give his wholehearted backing to the miners in their struggle with Margaret Thatcher's government. The miner strike was handled disastrously. Whatever view you took uh, of its origins, the fact is it was a fight. It was clearly a fight to the death. Uh, it was the single most important moment uh, in the uh, 1980s. It was a turning point. In a war of that kind, you don't try and sit on the fence or walk down the middle of the road, because as Nye Bevan said, if you walk down the middle of the road, you get run over by both sides. And that, of course, is exactly uh, what happened. And it was, I remember the Archbishop of Canterbury managed to get to a picket line before Neil did. The nature of the strike, its poor timing, and the fact that it was called without a full ballot made it seem a hopeless cause. Keep moving. No. You keep moving. No. Keep moving. No. 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 And Arthur Scargill's unyielding militancy conveyed an image of Labour which Neil Kinnock was desperate to change. No way. Listen, no. No way. Listen, no way. You're blocking the football. No. But Kinnock and Labour could not easily break with the past. Neil always believed that we could not criticise the Scargill decision simply because the Labour Party does not criticise trade unions and trade union leaders when trade union leaders are under threat from the government of their employers. It wasn't cowardice, it wasn't timidity, it was, if you need to have a uh, critical word, it was sentiment. The Labour Party does not criticise workers on strike. We should have criticised them much earlier. Neil Kinnock was paralysed by the miners' strike. As the dispute wore on, he half-heartedly visited a Welsh picket. He was neither able to condemn nor condone, agonising on the sidelines while Arthur Scargill and Margaret Thatcher fought the battle to the death. If that mandate had been sought, if they'd had a ballot, the whole political circumstances would have been radically altered. Uh, and there was I, uh, f confronted by that reality but also um, suffering my own, is not to overstate it, emo emotional turmoil because of my associations with the mining industry, with miners and their families, with my own family, and my desire at all times to see that they weren't further demoralized whilst knowing that they were heading straight into disaster. And uh, I suppose it meant that I didn't clarify in my own mind a strategy as clearly and as quickly as I should have. The test, really, the ultimate test, is not whether your ideology is fine or your rhetoric's good. But whose side are you on when the going gets rough? And by that test, he failed, and failed terribly. And it's uh, the miners fought on, and they continue to support the Labour Party. But they were decimated. And at the moment, they needed help from the Labour 
leadership they didn't get it. The defeat of the miners left a residue of bitterness, even 